Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, The Power of STEAM. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation using your computer speaker system by default for audio. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone in the audio pane in your attendee control panel to the right of your screen and the dial-in information will be displayed. We ask that all attendees please close down any open browsers, email, and social media for the duration of this webinar. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email within 24 hours with a link to view the recording. I would now like to introduce Patrick Leck, Vice President of Maxitherm, based out of Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Maxitherm is a flooded steam heat exchanger manufacturer for industrial process, building heat and reheat application, domestic hot water, CIP, clean steam generation, and steam quality control. Co-presenting is Tony Widener, North American Sales Manager, Power Generation at Elliott Group, based out of Houston, Texas. Elliott manufactures steam turbines, compressors, and other rotating equipment for the oil and gas, petrochemical power, and other various industries. With that being said, I would now turn it over to Patrick. Patrick, please go ahead. Thank you, Casey. Thank you for the intro. Hi, Tony. I, uh, with all those challenging times, I want to congratulate you. I, uh, you're going to be a new father in September, so I think it's a great news to share right out the bat. Yeah, thank you. 2020 is not going to be all that bad then, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, congratulations. And uh, it's our first experience together to share a webinar like this. So, hope people that are attending today will enjoy the content we've put together. There's one thing in common that Maxi Term and Elliot has. It's, it's all about steam. If there's no steam, there's right. no Maxi Term. If there's no steam, there's no Elliot. So, we have this thing in common, that's for sure. So we're gonna start this uh, presentation. Um, during the presentation, like Casey says, anytime you have question in the chat box, we have people with us. Uh, Maxi Term is joined with Marie-Hélène and Maxim that will answer some of the question, and Elliot is joined by Mike. Any question about Turbin? We'll try to keep this at the end, uh, Q&A uh, session, I mean, and uh, we'll do so. By the way, I'm from Montreal. My first language is French. If there's anything I'm saying, I'm saying you're not sure, uh, please chat and we'll try to answer. And Tony today is from Houston. That's pretty cool. I, I really like this concept. So I will turn, out, turn off my camera and we'll start right into it. Hold on. Okay. So let's start with some benefit of using steam because we're whole ear about steam. So steam is safe and reliable. So what you see, what who, who you see on the screen, she's my uh, second half, my soulmate, my wife. We are downtown Detroit, and I asked her to take that picture. And I asked her, "Do you feel the heat, honey?" And she said, "No, it's kind of comfy because it was a chilly day." And we were, I was presenting at Detroit Thermal the next day and I showed that picture. But it's just to show you how safe and reliable is this, because uh, if it was a gas leak or a hot water leak downtown Detroit, it's going to be a big problem, shut down the building and everything else. The other thing also is odorless, non-toxic, non-flammable, travel up to 10 feet per minute, 10,000 feet per minute, can be used for heating, cooling, and cogeneration, same steam, can be generated from multiple sources. So you can generate steam, of course, from fossil fuel, but from biogas, biomass, trash, which I think is the future, and even geothermal, maybe not with water, but that's something I know it's in the process. And uh, I'm a big fan of district energy. I think steam is the best way to go. And uh, with the flooding design I will introduce you to today, you can have a building with no chimney, no gas vents, no steam vents, and you can also consider electric microgrids because if you join two, three buildings together that have a decent steam load, you can put a steam turbine right in between. Couple of graphics also we wanted to share with you uh, from, this is taken from uh, E 
iia.gov, the annual energy outlook, to show that the electric demand, the electric need is still growing. Uh, not as fast as I, uh, as I would like, but even despite the fact that we do a lot of energy saving project, the demand is growing. So more uh, computer for cloud server, um, electric cars, of course, at some point also robots will come in. So all this will be, will needed electric generation. Also another good graphic, just to show you that any building, 20% of the electric needs, it's for cooling. So sometimes that's why we see steam electric chiller, um, I mean, steam cogen chiller or steam absorption chiller coming back. They take a lot of room, but they remove a lot of electric needs from your, so from your local grid. Um, this is what we're gonna talk today also. Uh, we're gonna compare uh, some numbers via the conventional power plant when you just use steam, if I should say, uh, which is generated by coal or any fossil fuel, then go directly in a turbine that really, really high pressure. And then with the exhaust of the turbine, typically there's a cooling tower to cool down the condensate and the steam and back to the border. So it's not really efficient compared to a combined heat and power, CHP. And there's two kind of CHP, of course. The first one we will talk the top left here that we will discuss today. And um, but there's the other way also to have a gas generator, for example, take, take the, the uh, gas exhaust, exhaust gas, excuse me, and do heat recovery system to generate steam or hot water. The downside of this uh, scenario, the one on the uh, bottom right, is that you need a gas generator for your electric needs. So if you have no steam demand or no hot water demand, you'll be back at 30% efficiency or so. So when you buy the boiler, you need steam anyway, no matter what, or you need heating no matter what. So based on your heating loads, you generate electric power. So you will not probably not generate electric power for the whole building, but a big part of it or a certain portion of it. So this is the concept we will talk to you about today um, using a flooding design, which will create a 100% closed loop for a new building, for example, or even for a ritual fit. And the concept, of course, is you need to create a differential pressure through the turbine. So higher steam pressure, you can come in, lower steam pressure, you can come out. And with the flooding design, if, if the steam pressure inlet is higher than your condensate back pressure outlet, you don't need a condensate pump. So this will be the receiver pump, if I should say, to go back in the boiler. And when you have a 100% closed loop, if you put a condensing stachanomizer here, like they do at Duke University, you'll increase the boiler efficiency. Now, <clears throat> when you don't use a flooding design here, what happens is typically a steam turbine will need about 4% more steam at the steam inlet to generate the right output here. So the 4% on top of the border efficiency, it's like five, 6%. But well, let's keep 4% more steam. When you use a flooding design, you'll be at, you will need 6% less steam minimum. And I'll show you numbers today. Generate the hot water you need here. So 4% more, 6% less, well, it's more than break even. So this is why it's a great combination of using a steam turbine with the flooding design. Well done, I don't know why we're not switching, here we go. So the way it works, there's only one moving part. This is the main moving part, the control valve, which is on the condensate. And when the valve is modulating based on your set point, the condensate level moves up and down in the heat exchanger with no water hammer, no nothing. Those valves at the inlet are on off device for a startup purpose or shutdown purpose, okay? But otherwise, the only moving part is the control valve here. What you see also on the screen, there's one thing I wanna pay attention, is right here we have a set point of 120 Fahrenheit. The return water is 107.5, 
you can see on the screen how many GPM is going through, what's the BTU load. But I want to pay your attention on the condensate temperature outlet. So in this case, we're downtown Philadelphia. They're using steam district energy and they're dumping to drain. Um, so typically conventional system, you will need a quencher to cool down the condensate under 140. In our case, we don't need so. And by doing so, by cooling down the condensate inside the heat exchanger, we drastically improve the efficiency of the whole system. I'll show you numbers. So this is some pictures we've uh, package we've done in the past. We can do complete skid package with the circulating pump for the building. This is for glycol system. There's a tank here for the safety valve on the glycol, a 4 million BTU process. This is a 30 million BTU process with 30, which means 900 horsepower. Uh, so imagine in your mind, a 900 horsepower boiler. Well, this heat exchanger is good for 900 horsepower. This is where we are so far. We can head to the list, multiple hospitals, John Hopkins Hospital, Boston Children Hospital, uh, factories such as Metacores, Pepsi-Cola, Merck, DuPont. So different kind of business. Uh, so this is a typical conventional steam design um, that we've been using for more than 100 years. What have changed over time is the color of the valves or the pumps and things like that. So typically you need a one third, two third pressure reducing valve. So you're gonna come out with high pressure steam from the border, bring the high pressure steam in every building in the campus, then you will reduce the pressure. So depending what's the differential pressure you want to reduce, you might need two stage of those valves. Steam safety relief valve, vent to the roof, bigger pipe because low pressure steam volume is bigger than one third, two third big control valve, which is the state of the art for have better turn downs. The heat exchanger, the condensate pump it can be steam or electric motive pump, vent to the roof. Then you go back to the main receiver tank at the border room, and then you'll need checks valve, vacuum breaker, insulation valve, steam trap separator, wax strainer. The list goes on and on. A lot of potential leaks, a lot of maintenance for the customer over the next 20 years. And this is probably one of the main reasons why people are running away of steam. So since I'm in the business, I don't know if some of you uh, read my bio, but I've been working with my father for years and we've been told many times not to start a business in STEAM because STEAM is a dying dinosaur, which it's not, to be uh, honest with you. We've been growing ever since. Okay, so this is the 100% closed loop. So when you use a flooding design, uh, you'll, you will need uh, less makeup water, zero flash loss, no more pressure reducing valve station, no more steam safety relief valve to the roof, because we stem the whole skid here based on the safety valve set point on the steam border. So the steam border safety valve set point at the other end is 300 pounds. We're gonna stem the whole skid for 300 PSI. Yes, we can use superheated steam as well. Uh, no condensate receiver pump, as long as your steam pressure is higher than your condensate back pressure, no pump. So 20% of our project, especially our retrofit, is low pressure steam. So let's say we're coming at 15 PSI here. After the control valve, typically you want to lift. So let's say we're lifting uh, 10 feet high. Every 27 inch give you one pound back pressure. So it's gonna, you're going to have about five PSI back pressure. You're coming in at 15, you don't need a condensate pump. When you go conventional way with horizontal shut and two, typically at 70% of the load and lower, you're operating at zero PSI. So if you're lifting two feet after the trap, you'll need a pump. Smaller pipe size because we can use high pressure steam, smaller control valve, up to 10 million B2 process. It's a half inch control valve. And again, it's the only moving part. So now today we give a five years warranty on the control valve. No vacuum breaker. There is a vacuum breaker that only shut down when you, they're only open, sorry. It only open when you shut down the system. And there's a huge benefit by not having the vacuum breaker because we, we, we don't inject oxygen anymore in the return lines. So less carbonic acid, less amines, uh, less corrosion, obviously. Energy saving up to 20%. This I will show you very soon. Stability set point to Fahrenheit, less maintenance costs, 
50 to 1 turn down ratio with one little control valve, less blowdown on the motor, less chemical also at the border uh, for the return lines. We're not going to cover this in details today, but these are the highlights of going 100% closed loop. So this is our number one competition. It's a condensing border, a natural gas. So just a recap of how it works is you need a cold water temperature return in order to condense the flue gas here. The flue gas dew point is typically 140 Fahrenheit. So if you're coming back at 160 Fahrenheit here, it will never condense. So we see more and more design with a set point around 120 Fahrenheit with a return around 90 Fahrenheit to make sure that all year round will be under 140 Fahrenheit return, right? So it can't be 140 if it's 120 set point. So let's apply this to a flooding design. So let's say we have a set point of 120 Fahrenheit with a return at 90 Fahrenheit. We can oversize the heat exchanger that condensate at full load will come out at 130 Fahrenheit condensate. If you had a condensing stack economizer, just like they done at Duke University, well, this become a condensing steam boiler, 90 plus percent efficiency, more longer life than any condensing water in the market, much better turn down, O2 trim ratio, and you know, all the thing about steam boiler. So let's run some numbers. So let's, we assume a 4 million BTU process conventional system at six PSI, because even if you knock down the pressure at 15, you will never have 15 in the heat exchanger. You'll have a pressure drop to your control valve. So let's assume we have six PSI. So mother nature says you're taking only latent heat. So you're taking, if you're looking at your steam table, 959 BTU per pound. So this, the total, pounds per hour, you will need a full load. With the flooding design, let's say we operate at 100 PSI, condensate leaving at 200 Fahrenheit. Then we extract latent heat and sensible heat also out of each pound. Total heat is higher, so we use 6% less steam. So this number, so if we were using 6 PSI also, this number will be more 3%, okay? But, what is the number for coming at 100 PSI and the condensate is leaving at 130 Fahrenheit? Survey says 12%. So the concept is you're using 12% less steam at the point of use for doing whether building heat or even domestic or water, right? And then you bring back condensate to increase the border efficiency. Of course, you can have a two-stage economizer, have a first stage here for feeding the border, but to preheat the water, you can have a condensing stack economizer. So we're not going to cover this in detail today, but we're working on another webinar about the 100% closed loop and condensing stack economizer. So for domestic water, for example, with those same numbers, 4 million BTU, right? But this time, condensate can leave at 70 Fahrenheit because the return is 40 Fahrenheit. Survey says 16.5. So if we're using 180 PSI, like downtown Philadelphia, well, that number will be over 20%, okay? So way less steam needed here by using a flooding design. And this is a partial list of cities around North America that does have central steam downtown, cities like Los Angeles, San Antonio. Okay, and, uh, and that also think about all the campus, universities campus that have central steam feeding multiple buildings. Some of them are charging steam for every building on the campus, uh, just like uh, Harvard, for instance. So there's a lot of potential of using steam. And like I said earlier, steam can, can be generated for different source. So you're not stuck with any fuel. So that present the 100% closed loop system, the flooding design to be combined with the steam turbine. So I will switch over to Tony that will explain you the steam turbine concept that's been existing forever. I mean, turbine is more well known. I mean, has more longer history then solar panels, geothermal, wind turbine, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's reality has been living forever. Anyways, Tony, they're all yours.
All right, thanks, Patrick. And you know, like you said, you're you know, you always been into steam. Well, Elliot's always been into steam. You know, we've been around 110 years. You know, hopefully, you know, well after my career, another 110 years will be around because I need that that pension. But anyhow, um, a little bit about <laughs> Elliot. Um, you know, for those of you on the on the webinar here today that may or may not know about us very much, like I said, we've been around since 1910. We're part of Ibera. Our, our headquarters is in Jeanette, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, we have two main manufacturing sites, the, the main site there in Jeanette and also in Sadagor, Japan. Um, we're also now starting to um, do assembly and testing in India for smaller steam turbines. So, you know, besides Jeanette, in the future, you know, you may have some other um, units that come out of India. Um, besides the two main plants, of course, we have service locations globally. Uh, I think there's 20, 25 or so different service shops throughout the world um, to be able to service equipment. And then, of course, you know, the main focus here today is talking about steam turbines, um, but we also manufacture compressors, centrifugal compressors, um, hot gas expanders, a lot of other rotating equipment for the oil and gas and petrochemical um, industries as well. I just want to have before the next you slide. answer, I'd like to have that I visit your Jeanette plant in Pennsylvania and I was really impressed, really impressed. It's big and you can see the parking lot here. It was full of cars. This is all Iliad guys. It's huge. It's among us. I was really impressed about that factor. Anyways. Yeah, and, and Ibera has really been investing in Elliot over the last number of years. So it's it's something that, um, you know, Steam, hopefully, and Steam-related products will still be around for a long time. Yeah. Hold on. There we go. You know, this is just a different slide to show um, when you're talking about back pressure steam turbines the variety of different industries and customers that, that use these types of units. You know, anything from various industrial customers in the oil and gas, steel mills, um, biofuel industries, a lot of colleges and universities. Many of you, maybe I'll be on this um, webinar today. Um, you know, certainly district steam um, systems throughout the country. And then, you know, healthcare providers, whether it's individual hospitals or larger type of um, healthcare hospital, um, you know, campuses, many of them use steam, you know, with back pressure type turbines. And it may not always be for power generation, but you know, they may be running chillers or, or, or pumps or fans or things like that. So, and, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more down the road, but um, saturated steam is also something that many of these customers use which is something I'm going to touch base on here in a little bit. So just, you know, just to show you here, this is, you know, steam turbines are a very versatile product. Um, you know, it's something that um, of a lot of different industries use. So related to the flooded heat exchanger design, um, you know, if we're talking about a typical pressure reducing valve or PRV replacement type of application. You know, Patrick and I talked about looking at just average loads. So, you know, these, these average loads that you see here at various increments, we took, you know, say 250 PSI saturated steam, and you're dropping that down through a valve down to 10, um, whether that's for heating needs or deaerator purposes, things like that. If we wanted to look at what the actual performance would be of a turbine generator at these various average loads. So these numbers that you see here are accurate numbers that we took out of our performance program, um, just to kind of give you some real data. So what does that equate to when you're talking about 40 kilowatts, or you're talking about 100 kilowatts, or what have you? Um, you know, the smaller ranges, of course, you know, you can maybe power a small building with that. Um, you know, or it's enough power to maybe operate some some critical loads in an industrial facility. 
um, depending on what size motors may be running certain um, components. And then you get a little bit larger, you know, that 100 to 300 kilowatt range. You can power, you know, larger parts of different facilities or even maybe a, you know, a, a large square foot building, whether it's a high rise or some other sort of factory warehouse, what have you. And then, of course, above that, you know, you get 300 kilowatts and above. You know, you're talking about a significant amount of power that can really offset your utility expenses. Um, you know, so it's something that, you know, even though these are, are, are standard products, you know, they, they certainly um, are customized for the given application to produce power. And when you look at a typical payback period, I think for the most part, we looked at various sizes in this range that we're showing here that were um, under five years. Yeah. And just uh, for the attendees, uh, rough numbers. So first thing I want to say is first we should stop designing, especially a new building and you're going with a steam border. Typically it's asked for 150 PSI rated. So I'm telling you, you should uh, ask for 300 pounds rated and operate at 250 PSI or even a little bit higher and go through a turbine and then distribute your steam. I think that's uh, the way to go. It's almost free power. And to, and to give you another number, when we say, for example, 5,000 pounds per hour, so just to make sure you all know the rule of thumb, that means about 5 million BTU. So if you have an average load of 5 million BTU all the year around, you can generate 85 kW with a five year payback. Right, so let's look at you know, average cost here now, um, you know, just kind of making some assumptions. Now, these are, even though they are considered standard products, um, you know, each one of them would be kind of custom made for its its given application. And of course, things like specifications or, or design standards and things like that come into play when you're talking about cost. But just to give you a rough numbers, you know, these smaller units could be anywhere from 200 to 300,000. Then a little bit larger units, you know, it could be up in the range of half a million or so. Um, you know, the installation costs when you're talking about, you know, seeing here that it could be up to 50% of that equipment cost. You know, even though these are packaged skids, um, to like in this picture you see here where you have connections at the edge of the base plate, you have junction boxes, things like that. Um, you know, you still require a, a level of service support when you're installing these things. So um, we can be involved as, as much as you need us or as little. You know, so some people, you know, they could want us there for every aspect of when the equipment arrives on site, a service tech is there to review the bill of materials, open the crates, make sure that nothing's damaged, you know, then come back for other Things and it could be multiple visits throughout the course before the units finally started up. So you could see, you know, how you know that could be up to 50% of the purchase um, equipment price. But you know, if there's a general contractor and things like that involved, some of those duties can be handled by somebody else. You may not need to have a, a service tech there. You know, so it, it's kind of a, a shopping list. You can kind of plug and play as much as you need someone there on site. So based on that, go to the next one, Patrick. Yeah. Based on that, we want to look at just different savings, um, savings and kind of um, return on investment type of simple paybacks. But so take take two of the bookends of of the power range that we're looking at. You know, a smaller unit in the 85 kilowatt range that was roughly a 5,000 pounds an hour you know, or 5 million BTU size system. If you're going to run that most of the year, um, you know, assuming this is somewhere with 10 cents a kilowatt hour uh, for your average electricity rates, um, you can see the savings there. And, you know, we factored in a little bit of maintenance cost. Um, you know, that $12,000 is kind of based on um, maybe a yearly inspection or, or personnel coming out to, to look at the equipment, you know, on a, on a 
standard shutdown or something like that. Um, but anyhow, you know, places where electricity is more expensive, like parts of the Northeast or California, stuff like that, your savings is going to be a lot higher. So you can just see here on the two different bookends, you know, the, the, I guess the range of savings that, that we would, that you would see at least from a reduced electrical demand from your utility. Yeah, and we didn't include the peak shaving also, it's just basic KW. Yeah. Right. So then, you know, when you turn that into a simple payback type of calculation, you know, you can see here we factored in the rough price of the equipment, cost of the installation, um, you know, cost of, say, consultants, whether that's maybe you're using some sort of electrical or civil engineering consultant to help with the overall project, or maybe there's some sort of um, EPC involved with the project. Um, you yeah, then you factor in, maybe there's an incentive available where I'm at. So you factor all that in, you can see here that for the most part, the, the certainly the larger the, the power output, the quicker it's gonna pay itself back. Um, but mostly like the ranges we're talking about are in the, around that five year mark. Um, and I, I think that's usually pretty good. I think, I think most maybe industrial customers are in that two to three year payback period, but, but other commercial type customers, maybe not, it may be longer. So, um, you know, when we factor in incentives, there are various incentives available, whether that's um, federal, state, local, um, you know, even utility providers have certain incentives. There's two different links shown there. Um, they they kind of do the same thing, just in different formats, but desireusa.org, and the other one is the EPA's website for the combined heat and power um, incentive database. And it shows just where you might be able to get uh, energy efficiency um, credits or self-generation type incentives, um, things like that, where some of it may be a grant, some of it may be a tax rebate or something. So you know, it's certainly worth looking into, you know, when you're look, talking about capital projects and looking to um, spend money. Uh, this slide, we, we kind of just wanted to put this on here because it's, you know, something to consider if you're really, you know, talking about central power generation versus distributed. You know, you can kind of see why maybe the last number of years, if not a decade, things have been trending more towards distributed generation. Uh, certainly microgrids and energy storage and things like that are coming more into play now. But, you know, just the fact that, you know, you're losing maybe up to 15% uh, efficiency loss just from transmission and distribution from a central um, power network. You know, that's something that you can capture now within yourself if you're especially if you're already using a natural resource to generate steam where you have steam provided to you as a utility why not use it you know to generate some of your own power and, and offset some of that electricity costs and those those energy losses on on transmission So to kind of give you a real life example here um, of a, one of these pressure reducing type stations, the University of Missouri um, was, was a project that we did a few years ago. You know, they identified some process inefficiencies where their central com combined heat and power plant was producing 60 pound steam, distributing it to the campus, you know, and also using it from some other things um, such as their deaerator. Well, you know, they identify that there's a process inefficiency there where you're reducing the pressure from 60 down to 5 for that deaerator. There's a significant amount of steam flow. Why not try to capture some of that energy in a steam turbine? You know, so they, what they ended up doing, go to, to the next slide, Patrick. The amount of steam that they had available was enough to produce about 300 kilowatts. So they installed this back pressure turbine, um, I believe it was late 2017, or it has been operating since about that time. 
And, you know, since that time, they've identified where they actually have real fuel savings and emissions reduction. You know, you can see the various numbers here that, that they provided just based on this small turbine generator, what it's really doing for them. Um, you know, they, they looked at, um, I think to date, so in the two, two and a half years that this unit has been operating, they've had a real uh, cumulative savings of about $400,000. And then you can see here, just to kind of give you a perspective on, so 300 kilowatts is enough power to um, power their entire library for a year. And that's about a 65,000 square foot building. Um, I think overall they, they said that in about four years, this unit's going to pay itself off. So those numbers seem to be, you know, in, in, you know, comparison to the, you know, the, the scenarios we were just looking at. So, you know, thanks to, to Harry Frank and the people at, at Mizzou, um, for really providing some of this information and being a part of a successful project like this. Yeah, absolutely. So earlier you heard me mention um, saturated steam. We get a lot of questions about that. Um, you know, it always seems to raise questions or concerns from customers. Um, so I thought maybe at least putting together some tips. And, you know, these are things that we've gathered either from talking with customers and operators or, you know, kind of our own experience. But, you know, one of the – actually, let me go back. One of the – biggest thing with saturated steam is, is, is it damaging to a turbine. Well, we like to have the steam, even though it's saturated, we like to have it as dry and saturated. You know, so that kind of sounds odd, but, you know, when, when steam is dry, you can still be at that saturation point, you know, but the steam is at least dry coming into the turbine, protecting the most critical components, you know, the inlet valve and first stage nozzle ring and things like that. You know, so it really extends the life of the of the equipment. You know, the biggest helper um, and certainly number one recommendation from us would be install a moisture separator upstream of the turbine. Um, it's something that we can provide as, as, a, as an item in our scope of supply. You know, it would be a loose supply item, but you know, that's that's probably the number one item that would really help reduce any moisture you know, then making sure you have the right number of, of traps where you need them and, and the position of them is is proper, um, you know, on the inlet and outlet of the turbine. So, you know, making sure that you can drain out any condensate that may be present. present. You know, from a boiler standpoint, um, you're looking at um, – the boiler makeup water chemistry, things like that, you know, making sure that it's, um, you know, clean water essentially, and it's kind of up to spec, you know, it's not going to have any carryover downstream and affect the turbine or any other equipment that may, may be downstream. You know, then one of the biggest things, and this is one of the things that's in every single one of our operator manuals is when you start up the unit, you know, making sure that the piping is drained out of any condensate and, of course, that it's nice and warm before you do bring that turbine online. Understanding what's downstream of that. So if you have saturated steam and you're going to run a back pressure turbine, there's going to be moisture present in the exhaust. So now how does that affect what's downstream of that? You know, things like heat exchangers, probably it doesn't make a difference, but what if there's other process equipment downstream, other turbines or things like that, you know, where now you have to do something downstream to make sure that, you know, the, at least the steam there is dry. So, you know, just understanding how moisture may affect those downstream components as well. Temperature transmitters, you know, certainly those sorts of temperature instrumentation in the piping helps you can know kind of where you are right at that saturation line because you will have you know slight pressure drop and, and temperature drop from the boiler to the turbine depending how far things are away um and then something we would provide is, is vibration when you're when you're checking vibration monitoring or when you have vibration monitoring 
and you start to see spikes in you know the vibration then that's a pretty good indicator that something may be going on with the unit you could have water in the turbine and it's causing some some issues now one thing to add and, and when we're kind of playing around with these examples of, of um, different pressure reducing type applications you know we looked at what if you added superheat to the steam you know say at least you add 50 degrees of superheat so on the smaller size um, say 2500 pounds an hour if you add 50 degrees of superheat to 250 pound steam that's really only give you another kilowatt or two now on the other end if you go to a 20,000 pound an hour average flow that 50 degrees of superheat might only give you up to 20 kilowatts extra power so you know even if you add more and more superheat you're not gaining a whole lot out of it for, as far as power output so your cost per kilowatt that you know that may be altered where if you're trying to add a superheater to a boiler that cost of that item is not really going to justify itself when the power output is minimal yeah i mentioned steam separators you know there's really two types that that we see that are very common you know a coalescing type um, separator where you have some sort of filter media or you have baffles in there that help um, separate the, the moisture from the dry steam but then a cyclone type you know which causes kind of like a high speed rotating flow um, you know those larger more dense uh, wet particles then drop out of the bottom and then can be drained from a, you know from a condensate trap So we were talking about you know the steam side of things and, and the process piping side of things. Now, what about electrically? Um, when you're talking about a turbine generator, you know, main the two main types of generators that exist you know, are induction or synchronous. And really, the highlight here, this is kind of a busy slide, but um, you know, when you're talking about installing a turbine generator one of the main things you want to ask yourself is do I want this unit to stay running in island mode if if the grid goes down if the answer is yes then you know you have to go with a synchronous generator you know it has the ability with with um, you know its own self exciter to, to stay running or at least you know if you have steam then the turbine can remain running um, you know as the steam is available or an induction generator you know, it's essentially an induction motor um, you know it doesn't have an exciter so it takes its its voltage and frequency from the grid that it's connected with so if you lose power you lose the grid that generator is going to have to shut down unless there's something else to to regulate its um, you know its its frequency and, and, and voltage there's there's also a rule of thumb um, when you're talking about induction generators if you know, roughly, if it, if that generator is going to be about a third or more of your total uh, plant load, then an induction generator is not the way to go. You know, you need other things like capacitor banks and things like that to help offset that reactive power. So, um, you know, if if it's going to be a larger unit that makes up a majority of your of your uh, plant load or your facility's load. Then you should go with synchronous. Want me to move to the next slide? Yeah, go ahead to the next one. So now, how does that in interconnect with with your system? You know, I thought this is maybe a little bit small on the screen, but it, I thought it was the best overview to show a, a single line diagram of how you know your generator connects in with. The control system and how that all connects in with you know a circuit breaker and then ultimately the utility um, you know you can see here like on the steam side you know the, you have pressure and temperature monitoring um, your, your, the control system is going to be looking at uh, pressure set points or you know ultimately um, you know trying to control the speed of the turbine but on the electrical side you know you're going to have inputs from pts and cts things off the generator like that 
that are going to be looking at current and voltage, you know, and those signals are going to go into protective relays so that, you know, if you have a case where, you know, it's an overcurrent or, you know, something that's reverse power, it's going to send a signal to those protection relays and open up the breaker disconnecting this um, generator. Now, you know, what, the leads or the electrical lines from the generator would connect into a circuit breaker or a switch gear type of a device. Now with, you know, with any sort of new generator into a, say a new system, we would be able to provide that circuit breaker, you know, the panel that would, you know, be dedicated specifically for this turbine generator. Now you may also have a case where um, the turbine it maybe is retrofitted into a existing facility and you have um, room in an existing breaker or, or, or switch gear, you know, where you can plug this unit in. But, you know, that control system, again, is going to take signals from all of that and make sure you're protecting this device properly. We're good? Yeah, go ahead to the next one, Patrick. Um, yeah, I mentioned earlier about different mechanical um, applications as well. So a lot of users, you know, that might run pumps or uh, compressors or blowers, or in this case, you know, you see a chiller there. Um, you know, you don't always have to generate your own power, but you can run a mechanical device as well. So, you know, it's something else that you can also, you know, do the function of dropping the pressure, but now you're driving a device to where you don't need mechan or you don't need electrical motor power um, for that pump or for that compressor or what have you. Go ahead, next one. So maintenance, you know, we saw kind of a reference to that maintenance price earlier. Um, you know, we would be able to come up with some sort of maintenance program specific for um any given application any given unit you know that that really breaks down into you know three or four different things the go to the next slide patrick the the daily and the weekly and the monthly activities you know the the monitoring of the equipment you know watching it um, as far as recording trends and things like that that's usually the customer or the operator's responsibilities. Um, you know, we may come in now uh, on a semi-annual or an annual basis to look at certain things. You know, when we would come in for an annual inspection, that may or may not be when the unit's running or not. You know, if it's running, um, we're not going to open the casing or anything like that. We're not going to cause you to shut it down just so we can look at it. You know, we're going to do visual inspections. We're going to check uh, all the seals, and we're going to check things leaks for for oil or steam or or water. Even um, you're going to look at safety devices, making sure the trip mechanism and all that is, is functioning properly. You know, you might do an oil analysis from the oil system just to make sure the oil is clean. Because you know, two things: clean steam, you know, dry and you know, the water chemistry is clean and clean oil will really help your unit run reliably for years. Um, the next level above uh, a, an annual inspection would be a minor inspection. That's typically on you know, every three years. That's where we'll do all those visual inspections, just like we did with the, an annual. But now the unit's going to be shut down. We're going to open up the bearing caps and look at the bearing checking for wear and tear on on seals and bearings and things like that, and replace those parts if needed. Now, major inspections every five years, you know, let's say that's your 100,000 mile, um, you know, inspection, you know, that's where you're really breaking everything down. You know, these are during uh, scheduled shutdowns. We're going to open up the top half of the casing, um, inspect the internal, look at the rotor, look at the um, nozzle rings and diaphragms, things like that, you know, and replace any parts um, that are needed. Of course, we're going to go through all that with the turbine, the gear, if there is one, the generator, 
the oil system, everything that's in our um, realm, you know, in our scope, basically, would be gone through with a fine tooth comb. Great. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, next slide. Um, I think it's my turn back. Um, so what we want to say on this picture, especially for retrofit application on existing PRV station, is you can keep those PRV as the backup. Now remember, by doing so, you will still need 4% more steam at the inlet if you keep all the steam user afterward the way it is. Um, but yes, the PRV station you can keep as a backup and put the turbine right underneath. Now, every time you're going to request an, another unit or future building, and we know that the average load will be, let's say, 5,000 pounds per hour, 5 million BTU per hour, why not include a turbine in the package? And what we were thinking also is, uh, let's say this is good for uh, 4 million BTU or 5 million BTU. We are in May. We are using 1.5 million BTU. We are generating, I don't know, 30 kW. And there's a, and then we're losing power, right? Uh, everything shut down, power grid failure, whatever reason, uh, your generator is going gonna, is, is gonna to turn on. But also, if we open a valve automatically to drain, to dump clean water to drain temporary at 140 Fahrenheit to increase the steam load and generate more power. So you have a pretty neat backup generator here, <laughs> which is an automatic valve to drain, and your turbine will generate savings all year round. So there's another way of seeing it also. So we can do full skid package with Elliot and for building heat, reheat, uh, whatever process you want to install that. And it will be only five connection for the main contractors or steam inlet, condensate outlet, cold water, hot water, and power. We were thinking also to offer a complete steam water room and generate power and hot water. So it will become a high efficiency hot water power border, right? And uh, to do and also, you know, those type of borders, uh, they're really great borders, don't get me wrong but they take a lot of room. There's a new generation, which we call the coil type, uh, really more compact, like four times more footprint, very compact. The downside of that design is the water treatment. You fail the water treatment and there's only one tube pass, so you plug the tube, right? In our case, if we do 100% closed loop, like a skid package can do, uh, well, the water treatment is not a big thing. So in so let's say we use those cold tap border to do a 3 million BTU unit to generate on average 50 kW um, with 100% redundancy on the maxi term, 100% redundancy on the border, one steam turbine with a PRV bypass if something goes wrong. Well, you need 25 by 25. Score, and that's it. If we do a 5 million BTU unit, you'll need 500 square feet. 10 million BTU, another 500 square feet, and a 20 million BTU will need more around 800 square feet. Now to end this thing, so we're more than on time, we were expecting to have more time together. So, um, well, next time we know it's gonna spend 16 minutes, depending how much question you have at the end, where we have a world-class lab and seminar room in Montreal. Uh, we do two to three, two to three steam training a year. Unfortunately, 2020 it's canceled for a reason. You know why? Well, we have rescheduled for next April 2021, June and October. You can register online. Actually, you should have access to N outs uh, from your pan from from your panel. Uh, you can download brochures of Elliot and Maxiterm as well. You have the steam training uh, brochure right there so you can access so we have a 30 horsepower steam border 100 psi we make work different system on different conditions there's a steam trap board here we don't manufacture steam trap so we make them work on different conditions hvc system 
Uh, it's free and typically we take care of the expense of our customers. So you register online. We take about 15 people at a time. You arrive on a Wednesday. We're having a dinner Wednesday night, full day's team training on Thursday, half day's team training on Friday. And yes, we do offer the PDH credit. By the way, if you want to know more about MaxiTerm, Maria Len's going to paste in the chat box another webinar to register to. You can pick your date from there and uh, also the length of the webinar, uh, a short one of 30 minutes or 60 minutes. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, on your website, they have access to a video training with PDH uh, allowing on this? Yes, we have about an hour long, you know, pre-recorded type video training that, um, you know, users can gain a PDH credit from. And it goes okay. more into detail about turbine design and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very technical. I remember. Um, so this is our room. So the, here's our some uh, video testimonial we receive in the past. This is to Liberty Tower uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, I never thought I would be excited about a piece of steam equipment technology, but these past three days I've done just that. This is um, Merck. Uh, telling us that consultant engineers will call us very soon, which it did, and we had uh, good orders with them. And this one is one of my favorites from a consultant engineer out of Chicago. I have attended several seminars in the past offered by various manufacturers, but this seminar offered by Maxiterm was quite different. It not only provided the information on Maxiterm products, but also has educated us about the power of steam. Here we go, what a strange coincidence. So yeah, we are very technical on that. Steam training agenda, steam basic design, of course, steam control, basic best practice in troubleshooting, steam electric power. So Tony is part of our training as well. Hydronic versus steam. This is my favorite part. This is where we kill, where we kill hydronic design once and for good. And condensing borders versus steam borders and heat exchangers. And I always talk about waste to energy also combined with district energy. So that covers pretty much our presentation. We're ready to take uh, some questions and answers. Casey, do we have some questions? Great, thank you uh, both Patrick and Tony. So as uh, Patrick just mentioned, we're now going to begin answering questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane and we'll try to get to as many as possible. We've had quite a few come in. Um, so with that being said, let's start with uh, the first question we got, uh, which is, are you controlling hot water discharge temp or condensate temp? Hot water discharge temp. Thank you. So the, so the control valve follow the sensors to keep temperature. There's, uh, not, there's nothing to control the condensate level. But that you need to register to the special webinar with MaxiTerm. At, with Mahila and just send the, the link. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, what type of packing rings do you use? Do you use high-low packing rings or brush seal type? That's for more for Tony, I, I presume, for the turbine? Yeah, so um, you know, a number of different types, either um, you know, a carbon type seal or um, you know, like a labyrinth type seal. We do have brush seals, but on only very select few, um, you know, designs, higher pressure designs. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question, I believe this one is for Patrick. Since the turbine removes energy from the steam, doesn't the heating system require more mass of steam to deliver the same energy BTUs. Where is the savings on the ROI calculations? Where is the cost of the steam or the fuel to make the steam? Okay, good question. So the concept is, is not to generate electric power based on your electric loads. It's to generate power based on your steam loads. So whatever is your building design require for building heat and domestic or water, and you generate 125 PSI steam, so it, it's a 10 million BTU, I'm not asking you to have more BTU. I'm just asking you to put a turbine in between and we'll generate whatever power we can based on your steam loads. 
And that's why the intro was to show that the flooding design uh, requires less steam than the conventional design. Um, yeah, and if you need 10 million BTU, whether as you're doing hot water or steam, it's still 10 million BTU. Don't get me wrong. So I uh, hope I answered a question, but uh, we're not doing power for based on your electric needs. We are generating power based on your steam loads, whatever is your steam loads. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, what type of thrust bearing you are using tapered land or pivoted shoe? Sorry if I said that wrong. <laughs> Tony? Um, most of them would just be a ball type thrust bearing. Um, you know, larger turbines, they, they would have tilt pad type bearings for both journal and thrust bearings, but the, you know, the sizes that we're talking about is just a simple ball bearing. And from the same person, um, we had another question. What types of blades, dovetails are you using? Uh, I'm not sure if I totally get that question. Maybe the the root, the blade roots themselves. Um, maybe the 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 lashing wire, or the type of um, shroud that we might use. Different designs. We have multiple different blade designs that had different um, styles, essentially. But you know, we would look at what's the best for that given application based on the steam condition. So that that's kind of one of those things that's the aero design and the type of blade and things that we use is, is custom for each and every application. Okay, and then um, again, is your rotor shrunk fit design or an integral design? Uh, mostly a shrunk on fit type. Okay, and then um, Someone has asked, can you show us an Elliott steam turbine layout and indicate its parts? Uh, probably not on this. Maybe we'll have to try to answer some of these questions uh, to that individual directly. Perfect. Uh, next question, would an application at an average load of 9,300 PPH from 250 to 90 PSI be viable? I think the answer is yes. Yeah, I mean, the pressure drop in the turbine itself um, is smaller, but yeah, you would get some amount of power output out of it. Um, you know, that, that 90 PSI obviously would work with your system, right, Patrick? So, um, yeah, I guess you would just have to consider the, the economics of it all. Makes sense. Okay. And are there turbines designed and successfully applied for 150 PSI G saturated steam? Yes. Um, you know, places in, say, like on Con Ed steam loop, that a lot of that area is uh, dropping from like around 150 down to maybe 8 or 12 PSI. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty common um, low pressure application, we would call it. Okay, we are breezing through these. Uh, next question is for your flooded vertical HX systems with the control valve on the condensate side as a package, GPM for GPM, BTU for BTU, where do you position yourself when compared to Spirex, Sarco, or Armstrong products for pricing? Well, it depends because um, Heat exchanger for heat exchanger will be higher. Um, I put a, a brochure about the uh, thickness and the level of construction and the end out. Also, uh, we, we are higher grade than ASME. We use TEMA. Uh, but overall design, I can send you also another uh, case study um, done by a well-known general contractor on the East Coast. Uh, Basically, is uh, install wise total, we're always about 20% lower cost because no more PRVs, no more steam safety reliever, no more condensate pump, 
uh, smaller piping, less welding, less fire watch, less insulation, less this, less that. And um, also we do a complete, uh, uh, there's another webinar also to show how far we go in terms of control, which is usually done on site. So there's a lot of advantage to go uh, maxi term design, but uh, basically it's a uh, 20, 25% install saving cost. Thank you. Uh, next question. Oh, just a, want... just Sorry, one thing I'd like to add to this question. Uh, we are not a commodity manufacturer, so we don't manufacture our own valve traps and things like that. We use what we consider is the best in the market, and we're not here to say to anyone that our valve is the best in the West. So meaning we use what we consider is the best, but we don't manufacture those. So if my valve that doesn't work one day, we need to change manufacturer for whatever reason will do. So we're not standing, uh, we're taking on the market what we consider is the best, sorry. Great. Uh, how do you modulate the turbine output voltage with variable steam demand? Tony? I don't know if I can answer that question very accurately. I'm not a, an expert controls guy, but we can maybe get you some responses on that. Usually, you know, you're going to have a few different um, set points, especially if it's, you know, say back pressure control. You're going to have a, a certain exhaust pressure set point. You know, and then your frequency of your um, generator, you know, it's roughly in and around that 60 hertz range. So you're going to try to maintain that frequency um, as much as you can, but it all relates back to you know, speed control on the turbine. But I have to get maybe some more details about that specifically from, say, one of our controls experts. Okay. And from the same person, what's the turndown on the turbine? Each is a little bit different. Um, you know, maybe a four to one turn down ratio at best, uh, maybe five to one depending, but um, you know, certainly it's something that we would look at. If there is a uh, range of steam flows, we want to make sure we know what those upper and lower limits are so we can kind of look to design the turbine so that it's operating almost 24 seven as much as possible. Okay. Uh, next question is, what is the biggest last stage bucket LST length Elliott turbine has? Um, I believe it's around 22 inches or so. And do you expect the steam turbine may operate on rotors first critical speed? No, for the most part, um, you know, these the smaller units or what we consider our YR type turbine product line are what you call stiff shaft machines. So you're operating below that first critical. Um, the larger units kind of operate um, in between the first and second critical. So, um, you know, the, depending on the bearing span is where you would consider whether it's uh, stiff shaft or, um, you know, flexible shaft. Okay. Uh, what types of balancing provision do you use for factory and field balancing? Okay, it's you, Tony. Sorry, ask that one again. What types of balancing provision do you use for factory and field balancing? In the factory, we have, um, you know, at-speed balancing for certain uh, units. We also have um, low-speed balancing. Um, in the field, most of the time, I think it would be a, a low-speed type of a balance, um, you know, where our, our, our service tech reps would be there to... Um, to, to balance the unit essentially. Okay. 
let's see. Is this concept typically implemented at the building slash user user level or at the plant generation level? Sorry, that might have been to a specific slide. What would you say, Patrick? I would say both. I mean, it depends on where the unit is. It, it could be in a in a, you know, a specific building's mechanical room, or it could be done at, say, a central plant before it's sent out to a campus distribution or whatever. Correct. So if there's a campus, for instance, uh, you can do hot water in the mechanical room coming from steam on the border uh, at the central plant, I mean, and then we generate power right on site. And sometimes we can do like microgrids. Let's say we're going to do hot water for, I don't know, three, four, five buildings around, and they're going to come at 150 PSI. We're going to go through the turbine, let's say, and reduce at 20 PSI, go in the maxi term bring back condensate without any pumps because we're pushing at 20 PSI and generate a small amount of power right on this side. Or like you said earlier, if it's a hospital, for instance, why not design the border even at 600 PSI? Because the big cost difference in the border, don't get me wrong, it's not the price of the border, it's a little bit. The burner will remain the same. I mean, it's just the big change will be the steam safety relief valve. That would be the big change on the border. A little bit thicker, of course, but not to raise the price twice the price. And the receiver tank will remain the same, uh, you know, things like that. So basically, uh, yeah, go as high as you can in the border room, go through the turbine, especially if you need a um, stationary engineer. And by the way, those guys you need on the maintenance crew because maintenance guys are gone. But uh, yeah, you can do right at the border uh, the maximum you can before distribution. You can do both. It all depends on your average level. Great, and uh, to, it looks like uh, we are reaching the end of our questions. Um, if we didn't get to any, we will definitely uh, reach back out to you individually if possible. Um, I did have one last question for you, Patrick. Uh, we did get asked if this presentation, a copy of it, will be made available to the participants in addition to the recording. Uh, yes, you can send me an email at patrick at maxi-term.net and I'll be more than pleased to uh, send you, uh, unless, uh, Tony, you're, you don't agree with me, but I think we're good to send a copy of the PowerPoint. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, fine. Great. Yeah. And uh, attendees, if you haven't had a chance, you'll see that there's also five handouts available in your control panel. You can download those directly and save them to your computer. Correct. Uh, so before we close out, do you have any closing remarks, Patrick or Tony? <laughs> well, I wish that uh, I'll see some of you in April or June next year. If there's any questions, uh, do not hesitate. Uh, we're all about STEAM. If there's no STEAM, there's no Maxi term, there's no Elliot. So hope you enjoy the webinar, the content and everything else. So, uh, and uh, oh, the email address, Tony Schoen, it's Patrick at maxi-term.net. Maybe uh, Marie-Hélène can write you in the chat box my email address. And uh, yeah. Great, so uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say thanks again, everyone, for joining. Um, you know, stay safe out there. Oh, yeah. Um, this might be the new norm when it comes to uh, lunch and learns. You'll have to provide your own lunch, but we'll certainly teach you something. <laughs> great. All right, great. Well, thank you, Patrick and Tony, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. The power of STEAM. Uh, our goal today was to give you a different view on how to make the most out of your STEAM systems and why STEAM can be considered a valuable energy resource. As a reminder, you will receive a follow-up email within the next hour with a link to the view, a link to view the recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Maxi Therm and Elliott Group, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.